Good morning and welcome to this hearing of the Committee of Governmental Operation. I'm the chair of the committee, Council Member Fernando Cabrera, and we're joined by my colleagues, Council Member Kalos, Powers, Yeager, and Levine. Today we will, and Levin, sorry. Today we will be holding a hearing on Introduction 1325, sponsored by Council Member Levin, in relation to authorizing the creation of legal defense trusts. When a New York City public official is accused of a civil offense related to his or her official duties, he or she is entitled under state law to, to public money to pay for his or her legal defense. When a public official is accused of a criminal, criminal offense related to his or her duties, local law allows for the law department in its discretion to provide public resources for his or her legal defense. However, when a public official or his or her staff is accused of or investigated for a criminal or civil offense that is unrelated to their official duty, such as in relation to a political campaign, issue advocacy or certain governmental or administrative issues, there is no law that allows for the use of public funds to pay for the legal defense or the legal defense of anyone else involved in the matter. In 2017, the Conflict of Interest Board, known as COIP, issued an advisory opinion which said that public officials could not raise funds above $50 per donor for their legal defense. That opinion, however, did acknowledge that occasional need for public officials to raise money for legal defense, just as any private citizens might need, and indicated that additional local legislation will be necessary for a proper legal defense fund to be established in New York City. This bill will establish a legal framework for public officials and non-public officials involved in a matter to establish legal defense trust to fundraise for the legal defense. As we all know, public officials are not highly paid and they are rarely independently wealthy. They are watched very closely for ethical and legal lapses. Defending against allegations and investigations for alleged wrongdoing can be financially devastating for someone of average means. Introduction 1325 will allow public officials to create a standalone trust to pay for certain criminal and civil matters, matters as long as those expenses aren't already being paid by the city. It will set a donation limit of $5,000 per donor and will place restrictions on who could donate to a legal defense trust. Lobbyists, people doing business with the city, corporations, LLCs, will not be allowed to donate and all donations will have to be reported to COI on a quarterly basis and posted online. The bill will include enforcement mechanism and have substantial fines for violations of the law. Many other jurisdictions have recognized the need for legal defense funds or trust. I look forward to this discussion on whether New York City should do the same. I would like to thank the sponsor of this legislation, Council Member Levin, for advancing this issue. I also want to thank our committee staff, Brad Reed, Elizabeth Cronk, Emily Forjohn, Zach Harris, as well as my own legislative director, Claire McLevain, for their work on this bill. And I invite the sponsor of this legislation to make a statement. Thank you very much, Chair Cabrera, for convening today's hearing. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I am uh, eager to have this discussion underway to discuss Bill uh, Intro 1325 to allow public officials to set up standalone legal defense trusts to raise funds for legal services. This bill would bring transparency and regulation uh, to a system that is in need of improvement. Legal defense trusts allow for a responsible and distinct system to be created in the event public officials, the unfortunate event, that public officials may need to pay legal fees should they face an investigation. All people, including public officials, deserve the right to a fair trial and quality defense against allegations of wrongdoing. However, the ne th that necessitates a clear and transparent system that includes proper oversight, and as public officials, 
um, we are subject to conflict of interest law and, um, and we need to be able to um, do so within the guidelines of conflict of interest law. Without clear guidelines, gaps in our ethics and campaign finance laws can pose a risk of co corruption or its appearance. Legal defense trusts have been used by federal, state, and local jurisdictions to allow officials to establish accounts to pay for legal defense fees in a regulated and transparent manner. New York City's Conflict of Interest Board ruled in 2017 that donations to a legal defense fund qualify as gifts under the Conflict of Interest Law and as such must be capped at $50 per donor. This ruling opened the door for today's legislation and the need for a common sense solution to cover legal fees in a regulated and clear way. I am proud to sponsor today's bill which will improve transparency and allow for the creation of a system that is accountable and separate from ca the campaign finance system. While every public official would hope to never have to set one of these up, it is important that it be done in a way that is regulated and accountable and not tangled up in campaign finance. In effect, the Legal Defense Trust would serve as a highly regulated lockbox that allows public officials to cover potential needed fees, prevent campaign funds from being used improperly, and honors the public's trust in a responsible use of their taxpayer dollars. I also want to highlight that this bill includes strict requirements around the creation of a trust, and we're informed by the expertise of good government groups. Uh, no campaign funds or public funds will go into the trust, and there will be no commingling of assets. This ensures campaign finance limits are respected, campaign funds are allocated only to campaigns, and legal defense trusts cannot be used as a loophole to circumvent campaign contribution limits. Each trust would also be set up and overseen by a trustee for maximum accountability, and there are strict limits on who can donate, how much, and where. No lobbyist, anyone doing business with the city, corporations, and LLCs are allowed to donate to an LDT, and contributions would be limited to $5,000. Intro 1325 provides a clear framework to set up a, a, a separate account with strict regulations on usage and clear and detailed record keeping and donations. It's overseen uh, as proposed in the legislation by the Conflict of Interest Board. Um, I urge my colleagues in the committee and council to sign on to support this legislation. I want to thank you all for your, uh, I want to thank the committee staff and the chair for their work on today's hearing. And I'll pass it back to Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, council member. And also want to acknowledge we've been joined by council member myself. With that, we'll do the swearing in. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cabrera, and members of the Committee on Governmental Operations and Council Member Levin. I'm Carolyn Lisa Miller. I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Conflicts of Interest Board. With me is CIB's General Counsel, Ethan A. Carrier. We are here to testify about Intro 1325. In March 2017, CIB issued Advisory Opinion Number 2017-2 making public advice it had given to a public servant as to whether that public servant may be the beneficiary of a fund established to raise money to defray that public servant's legal expenses. The board concluded that in the absence of specific legislation to permit legal defense funds, it had no legal basis to treat contributions to a legal defense fund any differently from other gifts to public servants. CUIB appreciates the council's action in addressing the regulatory gap CUIB identified in Advisory Opinion 2017-2. Intro 1325 creates a necessary framework for permissible legal defense trust that manages the possible conflicts of interest raised by creating, fundraising for, and administering these funds. CUIB commends that the council included in Intro 1325 strict limits on when a fund may be established, who may donate, how much donors may give, who may solicit donations, and how the donations may be spent. And importantly, COIB thanks the Council for providing in Intro 1325 both a disclosure regime that provides meaningful transparency for the public and an enforcement regime that obligates beneficiaries and trustees of legal defense trusts to comply with the limitations the Council has set forth. As a city agency dedicated to promoting good government, CIB notes for the council's consideration one aspect of Intro 1325 that intersects with the city's campaign finance law. Section 3-1102F2 prohibits a fund from paying, quote, criminal fines or penalties imposed upon an individual beneficiary, and thus permits a fund to pay civil or administrative fines, such as fines imposed by the New York City Campaign Finance Board. 
We defer to our colleagues at CFB to address how this provision might impact the integrity of the city's campaign finance system. While CYB embraces the new regulatory regime proposed in Intro 1325, this will, without question, entail substantial additional work for CYB. CYB is a small agency with an even smaller budget and will require additional funds to fulfill the requirements of this legislation. These new costs fit into two categories. First, the initial cost to build a reporting portal for use by trustees and by the public, and the related recurring cost of managing that portal. And second, the ongoing personnel cost to hire staff to perform the law's required quarterly audits. We have made an initial inquiry to a software vendor with whom the city regularly contracts to estimate the cost to build a new reporting portal, and the initial estimate was approximately $40,000, in addition to subsequent annual licensing costs. Second, because Intro 1325 requires CIB to audit each legal defense trust on a quarterly basis, and because CIB currently performs no auditing functions nor a certified and generally accepted government accounting standard, GAGAS, we will also need to contract with a GAGAS certified auditor, which we have been advised will cost between five and $10,000 per audit. CYB has only 26 employees fully staffed and a very limited budget allocated for other than personal expenses. We have no leeway in our budget for the substantial new expenditures that Intro 1325 would require us to make. Thus, we ask for additional budget allocations to permit the agency to implement and administer the legal defense tr trust law with the speed and care it merits, especially in light of the fact that the law comes into effect immediately upon passage. And as the law itself recognizes, there will likely be quick demand to register legal defense, defense fund trust with CYB. We stand ready to work with the council and with the regulated legal defense trusts to ensure the smooth implementation of this law. We are happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you so much for your testimony. I really appreciate you. You went right to the point. I love it. I love those types of testimony. I want to thank you both. And, and the Conflict of Interest Board for all that you do. I know what you do is not easy. Sometimes we have gray areas uh, in which uh, we, we need clarification and you always seem to come through. So um, I just have two brief questions. One uh, is related. I just noticed that you're asking for funding. Can you estimate how much funding you're gonna need? Well, we need at least, we need to build out a database which we believe will be about $40,000 from scratch. Um, with the vendor that we're working with. And then any reporting portal that you have has annual uh, costs that are required to have subscribers, um, so, which would be a couple thousand dollars per year. And then we do no auditing at CUIB. Um, we have no staff that does it. We have no certification to do it. So we need to ha contract out for that work, which we understand would be between five and $10,000 per audit. Um, if an audit happens quarterly, so every legal defense tr trust would have four audits per year, it's hard to estimate um, in advance how many trusts would be registering with the Conflicts of Interest Board, but if it's 10 per year, that's, you know, $100,000. If it's, you know, more than that, so on. Do you, do you have uh, an estimate of how many uh, people at this point uh, would uh, use if this law were to pass, uh, use this opportunity. Uh, so for example, I know there, this allows for former uh, elected officials as well. Do you have like a guess based on conversation, conversations that you had in the past or? We, we don't have a guess. I mean, certainly there's been a uh, widely reported an elected official who might be in need of a, a legal defense uh, trust. Um, so that's one. Um, and since the law, as currently written, provides for a legal defense fund trust to uh, pay for campaign finance penalties, we understand that that's not an infrequent occurrence for uh, an elected official to incur some penalties related to the reporting requirements of the campaign finance law. So could there be, you know, 50 a year? Could there be more than that? But we are, I'm just guessing. Okay, I, I want to go back to uh, section 3.1102 F2. Can you be a little bit more specific about uh, this section? Uh, and also, uh, to the heart of my question would be, why was this section put in in the first place? Oh, what I, was the thought? Do you the, happen to know? Do you have I, I don't. We're, we weren't the drafters of this bill, so that, that I don't. 
I can't speak to why this provision is in there, but the provision provides for the, prohibits the payment of criminal fines or penalties, um, thus by the drafting of the law, permits the payment of civil uh, or administrative fines or penalties, um, so that the, the most um, logical or the most obvious source of civil or administrative penalties that city elected officials might be subject to are the ones imposed by the Campaign Finance Board. Hmm. I'd be curious to know what was the context, why was that put in in the first place back then, what, what were their fears, what were their concerns, uh, but if you happen to have some old timers uh, at the Conflict of Interest Board, we'd love to find out later well, this, on. Well, this, this law was not, this, this law is not something that's ever existed in the co context of the Conflicts of Interest Board. We understand that it was drafted um, by the council staff and, and with consultation of um, other people at the mayor's office. And so this is not a bill that we created. I imagine it was created to have that provision permiss permissibility. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to pass it to the sponsor of the bill, Council Member Levin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you all. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the kind of general context of kind of how we arrived here. Um, so um, up to this point, had there ever been, had New York, had COIB ever had to opine on, um, on a legal defense fund or legal defense trust before? Before the advisory opinion, correct. We yeah. we had confidentially. You had confidentially, okay, um, but not not publicly. Not publicly, correct. Um, now, can you maybe provide some context about the contrast, maybe if you know, uh, with state law and how state elected officials, how it's governed for state elected officials? Can you speak to that at all, or do? You well, I mean, o only to say that um, you know there there. The, the state law is developed according to, you know, the, the law as it's written for state employees. And here in the city, we're subject to Chapter 68 of the city charter. So, mm. um, you know, we, we can only implement the law that we have at hand. Right. Um, and so, you know, in the, in the absence of a law like the one that we're um, discussing today, um, the, 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 gifts, the gift prohibitions that are in the city's conflicts of interest law Mm -hmm. um, the board thought that there's no way to treat it any other way than that. That's all the, the law that there is. So um, this provides, uh, uh, you know, a regulatory scheme uh, that addresses mm -hmm. that. It provides uh, for a possibility of having legal defense trusts and regulates them in a way that um, really addresses the kinds of conflicts issues uh, that I think you'd be concerned about in such a regime. I guess the reason I ask is that, so I, my understanding is that on this, on, for, for a state elected official, campaign funds are, can be used for, um, for legal defense. Um, and um, that's not an ideal situation. That's not, in, in my opinion, it's not an ideal um, application of campaign exp uh, funds. And um, it doesn't seem to me in line with why people would be giving campaign funds at the donations in the first place. and so. Um, you know, I, I, one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, uh, do this bill was so that we are able to kind of make a clear demarcation between campaign finance and uh, legal defense trusts. Um, do, it does, has COI kind of opined on the, on the wisdom of, of, of creating a separate and apart system from campaign finance? It, uh, no, it has not. I mean, in, you know, in campaign, I mean, obviously, campaign finance law is outside of our wheelhouse. That's, mm. you know, the campaign finance board um, is, is are the real experts here in the city about about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the focus of the board's uh, work in this area is just to say that when public servants are given something of value by somebody, that that has to be looked at, uh, and it's not in the realm of uh, regulated um, money like the Campaign Finance Board uh, regulates uh, that we, um, at the board, that the Conflicts of Interest Board has to look at that as a gift. Yeah. But we don't, you know, campaign finance law is really outside of our area right. of expertise. So. Have you looked at other jurisdictions that, that have provisions for legal defense trusts around the country, whether it's the federal government, I know that I think Congress has one, 
um, or other states or cities? Uh, just a little bit. Um, are you able to kind of share what you've what you found? Well, I can say that the, the one that's being introduced today uh, or that we're discussing here today really addresses conflicts of interest uh, concerns uh, really quite well, I would say better than uh, most of the other jurisdictions I've seen. So mm. uh, from, the pers from our perspective, which is the, the, the conflicts of interest perspective, um, this, this bill really addresses those sorts of concerns in ways that um, other jurisdictions mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like do not as good a job, frankly. Um, in terms of the mechanics, um, you, talk, you spoke in your testimony about the need for additional resources at COIB. For one thing, COIB does a tremendous amount of work um, with a very small staff right now. Um, and, and so we acknowledge that and recognize that because you are receiving uh, matters uh, far and wide um, throughout city government. Um, in terms of the, the online portal and, and ways to make it publicly accessible um, um, and outward facing or publicly facing, um, and then obviously managing um, disclosure statements or audits and um, in a way that's um, you know both user friendly and and outward facing um, is that something COIB has any experience with or is that would that be kind of new territory for COIB? The audits will be a hundred percent new we, we do nothing like that we have done nothing like that mm -hmm. the online portal we, we have a model with the council's, uh, what we call chapter nine, the local law 181 of 2016, having to do with the regulation of affiliated not-for-profits. So we build, we've built out a portal that will have that similar um, ex external facing um, style to it, where people input information and they're reported. It's, it's um, we'd have to build, have a new kind of one to function um, at the, at, in, for these kinds of things, but we have some, some modest experience with that. Okay. that database has not really gone live yet because the first reporting period uh, is due on August 1st of okay. this year. Okay. Um, obviously there's, you know, there's a, a wide range and, and, you know, on campaign finance both CFB and State Board of Elections have, have very, you know, kind of well-developed um, outward-facing disclosure um, abilities in their systems and so it's, you know, Obviously, it, it can be done, but uh, the resources need to, to be there, I agree. Right, the campaign finance board's budget is, is probably five times, right. and the staff is five times that of the conflicts of interest board, and their software system is proprietary to them. That's not something that we can leverage in any way. Got it. So we have to, we'd have to build something from scratch. Right, okay. Um, and then uh, uh, other than the, <clears throat> uh, the matter that, that you discussed in your, um, in your testimony regarding civil, uh, um, civil fines uh, uh, that intersect with campaign finance um, as you see it. Are there any other um, recommendations or ways that you think that this bill can be strengthened um, to allow for increased transparency and accountability? No, we think this is a good bill. Okay. We, we have no, no ways that we think it could be better than it is. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, let me acknowledge we, were, we, we are joined by Council Member Parkins and Rodriguez. And with that, let me pass it on to Council Member Powers, followed by Council Member Yeager. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for being here. And I want to thank uh, Council Member Levin for uh, his, I, I think it's thoughtful legislation to try to address a difficult topic. Um, I want to, I had a couple questions. And um, the first one I want to start just because of your testimony raised it, which is this would, just to clarify, this would allow candidates who are this allow elected officials to pay off their CFB fines using this legal defense fund? Is that correct? If uh, right, so the, the a beneficiary has to be a, a public current or former public servant. So it has to be someone who was either a city employee and ran for elective office or won their elective office. But yes, in answer to your question. Got it. And and did you say former elected officials too, or, or former candidates? What was the former? Uh, no, no, no. That, that it would have to be a public servant, at least. So because they're all, they're governed by the COIB right. law, unlike exactly. the former. And um, are, are there concerns around? So under that scenario, 
I think under this current regime, you would pay off your CFB fines with your campaign finance money, the money you raise from donors, which is now currently capped at 2850 or 1000 depending on which system you take. But the voters just voted for $1,000 for like a city council member, let's say. Under this system, you get to raise $5,000 for your legal defense fund. So it, it, I wonder if you guys have any thoughts on whether there's a inherent conflict or, um, or thought process around being able to, uh, if you got fines for collecting over the allowable amount, for instance, a $1,000 amount, you could then open up a secondary account and raise money at the $5,000 level, which is five times the, the, the amount under current law. I, you know, I think that the, the how this works with campaign finance law is, is really outside of the scope of what the Conflicts of Interest Board does or is, uh, or is frankly our, out of our area of expertise. This is really a question for the Campaign Finance Board. We just wanted to, we just wanted to flag that as a, as a thing that, that should be thought about. And has the CFB made a comment to you about their thoughts on having a, another fund that has different limits versus the current limits? Uh, our, we all CFB has uh, advised us. Uh, we, we consulted with them about about Gagas, about uh, generally accepted government accounting standards, because they have those standards as well. And uh, we were trying to figure out how sort of expensive it is to deal with those uh, sorts of things. Um, but outside of that discussion, we uh, we haven't had a substantive discussion with them about um, about you know, the, the sort of substance of this of this legislation. Okay, and then on the campaign contribution limits, just generally here, for the fund contribution limits, I should say, at $5,000, do you feel those are appropriate and comfortable? And maybe can you tell us what the limits are in other jurisdictions? Uh, I, I don't recall exactly what the limits are under other jurisdictions, but I this, this number uh, seems like an appropriate number to us, particularly in light of the limitations on uh, who can contribute funds. There are some strict limitations about who those people can be, uh, including they can't be people in the doing business database, can't be subordinates of the person who is uh, soliciting the funds. Those sorts of, uh, those sorts of restrictions, uh, I think, are, are quite sensible um, and uh, really address the, the primary kinds of conflicts of interest that one would be concerned about here. Um, and uh, so, you know, with that, I think uh, Five thousand dollars for this is a is a reasonable uh, a reasonable number. Um, it, it has to be a number that's high enough that uh, somebody can actually uh, put forward a legal defense. Um, so I I, I I think we find that to be a pretty reasonable arrangement. Okay, thanks. Oh, and I, you, I, I'm I'm so sorry. And to add also the requirement for transparency is obviously a hugely important requirement. And, and do you feel like the transparency and the disclosure meets your uh, your standards in terms of what you expect, and I think it's quarterly reporting right now, so do you feel like you'd rather have in-time reporting to know who's giving, or, or do you, is, is, is quarterly a recommendation from COIB, or what, what do you feel like is the appropriate uh, reporting uh, time? No, we, we haven't made any recommendation about the, about the timing of the reporting. Um, obviously, the more frequent the reporting, the more expensive it is to administer. Um, uh, you know, quarterly re quarterly reporting seems like a reasonable frequency. Um, we don't have any objection to that. Okay, and um, and and if you do receive, if you do receive CFB violations as one of the categories that you have to then have oversight over in terms of people setting up legal defense to pay off their uh, campaign finance boards, that as you noted, would probably jump the amount of people who who could be in it from a, a, a handful today to up to 50 or perhaps if, if people choose to use that as a mechanism. Um, so your, your staffing and your resources, as I know as you note, um, are, are a concern in terms of how you administer the program. So if you have 50 people that suddenly decide to take advantage of this program, do you feel like outside of addition, if you, if you receive no additional resources to help administer this, do you feel like you can still adequately administer it? I, we, we don't have the resources to manage the auditing for a single fund at this moment. So any auditing that we would have to do would have to be done with additional resources. Okay. Um, thank you. And are there, are there ways you feel like this could be made more transparent, both in terms of the donors to the fund and expenditures and, uh, and yeah, funds and expenditures? I know we, we think that the, 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 
the reporting and transparency uh, piece of this is is uh, quite robust and, and sufficient for its for its purpose. Thank you. And can you l let us know? Uh, Ten probably states and five cities, or some variation of that number, have in put these into place. Can you tell us any any um, concerns that have been raised in those other jurisdictions, whether it is about who's contributing to them, disclosure, transparency, limits, other concerns that have been raised, or issues that have come up as a result of the funds? I I I can't uh, I can't. Uh, testify to what sorts of concerns have been raised about legislation that exists in other places. We've, you know, very briefly uh, surveyed a few other significant jurisdictions uh, that uh, have laws like these. Um, uh, many of them touch on some of the uh, issues that are addressed in this law. Uh, I don't think any of them actually managed to touch on all of them. Uh, and in that way, I feel like this bill is superior to the ones I've seen, the laws I've seen in other jurisdictions. Um, uh, I don't recall other jurisdictions having restrictions uh, uh, outside of the kinds of restrictions that are in this legislation. Okay, and I'll just ask one or two more questions because I respect of, respect of my client, uh, of my of my colleagues here. Um, are there, what's a, what would be the timeline for you to be able, I mean, I know you don't, you need resources to be able to administer it, but just even for, to create the rules that would needed to be made here and the ability to get a, a, a fund set up, what would be the, the timing that you anticipate before somebody could take advantage of it? Well, the law is written to come into effect immediately and has a provision uh, that requires the board to accept, uh, you know, essentially good faith submissions um, uh, in, in, you know, form that sort of reasonably captures um, the, the requirements of the law. So, uh, so people should be able to do so uh, essentially as soon as the law, as soon as this bill becomes law, um, you know, as far as uh, the board creating uh, regulations to interpret and implement the law. Uh, obviously, that has to go through the CAFA process, and so that takes some time. Uh, we would, of course, move that uh, through that process as quickly as possible uh, for public comment and hearing. So, and I just, what happens if somebody does it tomorrow and you don't have the staff or resources to administer it? Well, we would we'd certainly be able to accept submissions that uh, that a legal defense trust made, uh, and we would be able to provide uh, guidance to uh, legal defense trusts that were seeking guidance uh, about this law. Um, the, um, the the we would not have uh, the you know the online uh, database in order to be able to easily collect this information. Uh, make it public, people would not, you know, the, the sort of details about what they need to submit in order to be in compliance with the law wouldn't be necessarily readily obvious to, to uh, people who are setting up the trust, but we could, you know, essentially take what we are given and make it publicly available as close to the law as is required. The thing we would uh, most notably not be able to do is perform the quarterly audits of these, uh, of these trusts. Okay. Right. Without the money, we couldn't build a database. So we, the the public version of these reports would be the most rudimentary form: scan documents, put on the website, without any ability to look at the data or work with it in a meaningful way. And without, and certainly, we have no money to for an auditing at all. I'm not sure if this is necessary or not, but have you considered any sort of limit at the high end of how much you could raise in total for a fund? Uh, again, this this wasn't a bill that we proposed or were or recommendation. Um, we don't we don't see one. We think there'll, there's going to be some natural limitations based on you know who's able to donate and uh, the time frame for paying these costs. Can you just, from, that, it, 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 oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to add to that uh, that because there are limitations uh, on what the money can be used for. Um, uh, I you know the there's there's not a lot of incentive to raise. Uh, money beyond what's useful for that purpose. Got it. And you raise a, uh, a good a, a point, which is about limitations on how you can raise, how much you can raise because of who's willing to give to the fund. So, who who are the expected people to give to a legal defense fund? I mean, our best guess are the. I mean, it's because it's more restrictive than the kind of people you can go to. You're sort of. I mean, you would know as elected officials probably better than we do. We do no fundraising. So people who are in the social group of, an, of a person who needs a legal defense fund, uh, associates of some kind, 
you know, community members, things like that. Can family members give to a uh, elected, I don't, I should know this, but can, can family members give to elected officials for a legal defense fund, I'm oh, sorry, absent a legal defense fund, can family members contribute to a, a family member to help them pay for legal expenses? Yes. Without a fund, just today. Right. Who else can give to a, a um, somebody with a pre-existing relationship, I guess, would be the other answer? Who, who can give to somebody right now to help pay legal, de legal defense? Uh, right. So, uh, you know, it, it, dep it depends a little bit on sort of what position you have in the city government. But generally speaking, if you're, uh, you know, if you're an elected official, the, the, the conflicts of interest law prohibits you from accepting uh, gifts of a value of $50 or more that are given to you because of your city position. And so um, that, you know, that means that there's a, a, a sort of category of people who have interests in the, in the city uh, and who, uh, you know, would be motivated to give money to an elected official or city official because of that, uh, who would be limited to that, that uh, you know, de minimis, 50, uh, less than $50 sort of amount. But, um, but you know, as generally your, your you know, your family members can give to you in, in whatever amount uh, they want, and uh, uh, people with whom you have had a, 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 a very long, you know, personal friendship that's where it's entirely clear that that friendship is uh, 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 what's motivating the gift and not city position, so people who don't have matters, you know, pending in the city and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, I think that those those people are permissible under the uh, city's conflicts of interest law. Um, those would be examples of people who could who could give funds. Got it. And I, I recognize the complexity of this debate and the necessity. And I I do commend um, uh, Councilmember Levin for putting forth a bill that I think addresses many of the issues and models itself after. I think one concern I do have is that point: is that who then becomes motivated beyond the allowable category of people to be able to give to a legal defense fund, and what is the the, the motivation to do so? Um, but recognizing that that is a one consideration we have to take into with all the other considerations of those who may want to uh, set up a legal defense fund. Um, but I, I wanted to say thank you for answering the questions. I, m I may have more, but I think I'm done there. And I know others probably have questions as well. So thank you. And thank you to the chair. Thank you so much. Council Member Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh, just to, to piggyback on uh, my colleague Councilman Powers' question, an answer from you. Uh, if, if a person who was in need of such a fund wanted to ask family members to give or close personal friends who don't have business dealings, they wouldn't need a fund, right? They could just get a check from a family member. Under the current, uh, under the city's conflicts of interest law, you can have, take a gift from a family member. If that a specialized if account and a trustee and an ETPL fund or anything like that? No. Right. Right. Yes. That's correct. Okay. You are correct. Just wanted to clarify that. Um, on the on the reporting tool that uh, you say may cost approximately forty thousand dollars, and as we know, nothing in government costs the low number. So if the number is forty, it's always going to be more. Have you had a conversation with CFB about somehow uh, rejiggering or figuring out a build out of their reporting tool? They have a robust reporting tool for reporting contributions and expenditures and it's electronically submitted. Um, uh, it's, it's really a, a, a high version of a QuickBooks, um, and it allows people to run an entire account through a reporting system. Have you spoken with them about whether or not you can benefit by having them do a little build out using the folks internally that they have? We have, and they, they, it's proprietary to them. That's not something that they'll, they would build out for proprietary us. Proprietary to the Conflicts of Interest, to the Campaign Finance Board, Right. which is therefore not available to the Conflicts of Interest Board. That's correct. They, they get city checks, to your knowledge, uh, as part of their pay? Uh, that, that's not my uh, are, are you aware, are <laughs> area you aware, of expertise. Are you aware if they are city employees? They are city employees. Okay. And so they're not willing as city employees to share the information that is paid for by, I presume, the taxpayers with your good agency, which is also a city agency, and you too are paid by the taxpayers. That's, that's our understanding, correct? Well, now it's ours too. Okay. Um, the, uh, you said, you indicated that uh, 
you said you provided confidential advice in the past uh, regarding legal defense funds, and without giving us any uh, confidential information about the requester, obviously there's anonymity attached to that, but are you able to give us some kind of uh, indication of what advice you've given in the past prior to advisory opinion two of 2017? Uh, we can't, the confidentiality restrictions. Fair, fair enough, I wasn't sure how that worked. Okay. Yep. Um, the, so in my estimation, the reason that we're here today is that the board, uh, whether rightfully or wrongly, we'll leave that maybe to a different time, but determined that if a candidate, well, not candidate, because you're not the campaign finance board, but if a public servant or elected official were to receive a contribution towards paying a legal expense, that is a gift. Although the board doesn't consider campaign contributions to be gifts. So in your estimation, if a candidate were to raise funds in a campaign type account to pay for legal expenses, which is permissible under New York State and New York City law, that would not be a gift, right? That's right. Okay, so the only reason that, that we uh, have this bill and that it's, uh, it, it's necessary for us to engage in this endeavor is if somebody wishes to pay for legal expenses using this trust form out or a legal defense fund outside the, the uh, I guess the, the four corners of a campaign committee. Correct. Okay. So in your estimation, would it be better for some people simply to use their campaign committees to pay these expenses? I mean, you're, I know you don't, you don't opine on campaign law, but as a practical matter, you're an attorney, and I don't know if you are or not, but uh, you are, right? I yeah, am. okay, so we can go. You've been doing this for a long time? Yes. What's the, I mean, wouldn't it be better to, you have, you have a campaign committee that's governed by New York State law, it's governed by New York City law, we have a robust reporting system, wouldn't it be better to just simply raise into that committee, pay your expenses, and carry on with your day? Well, th this law provides for more than just the campaign finance related um, legal defense issues. What? Well, it has to do with electioneering and other things. So the, the, it doesn't only have to do with fines that are paid, would be arguably paid for by the campaign finance board. I mean, Not the, just fines, I'm saying legal, it, it, this is a legal defense fund. It's the purpose of which is to pay for lawyers yes. and possibly non-criminal penalties. Right. Okay, so, and nothing else. Correct. So if a candidate wished to use, if a candidate who was a public servant wished to use a campaign account to pay for legal expenses and non-criminal penalties, they could use a campaign account, right? For certain kinds of expenditures. What, I mean, can, the, what can't they? Well, if it was a, there, there are, I mean, the, the most widely reported person who needs a campaign, who would need this kind of legal defense fund are not penalties that are owed to the campaign finance board. It's and not, I, but it's not just for penalties, it's also for legal defense, for, or for paying legal lawyers. Defense. Right. And, and is there any reason why legal fees of that nature can't be paid for with a campaign fund? I, I believe that they can't. I can't, they can. I can't speak authoritatively okay. on that topic. They, they, so they can, and, and I think we're here today because, um, because uh, and, and for good reason, because I, I actually do believe that uh, public servants who are, who are faced with circumstances such as some of the people we've heard about uh, do have to have the ability that, you know, people who go into public service are, are not often rich, are often not rich. And uh, when they have an investigation or an inquiry of such, they can easily, it can easily turn into the kind of fees that we've heard about in the press and uh, they can easily bankrupt somebody. Um, realistically speaking, candidates who face inquiry by the campaign finance board can also spend tens of thousands of dollars on lawyers, legal fees, accountants, auditors, and whatnot, and, but for the structure of having a campaign account, can also be bankrupted. But my point is that, um, but for the fact that the board itself, your board, not the other one, had determined that, that contributions to paying legal fees are necessarily gifts, versus run-of-the-mill campaign contributions, that's why we have to create this new structure. And I don't know that, uh, you know, and recognizing stare decisis and that, you know, you have, you issue an advisory opinion and it should remain the advice that is available to the public and, 
and we actually have, a, have uh, we, uh, enacted a bill last year that requires that your advisory opinions after a year uh, uh, be promulgated by rule and, and have the weight of enforcement, otherwise they kind of go bye-bye. But um, I'm wondering if there's an opportunity for you to go back to your advisory opinion and, and look at it in another way and through the light of that there is an actual existing infrastructure under the state election law, under the city administrative code for candidates to uh, raise, or again, I, I'm sorry I'm using the word candidates, for, but for public servants and elected officials in particular, and perhaps not public servants because they don't have campaign accounts, but elected officials in particular, and that really is who we're always talking about when it comes to these things. You don't see the guy at the sanitation department opening up a legal defense fund. Um, I think that you have an opportunity to go back and look at that advisory opinion today through a different light and see if maybe you can give a, some different, not better, not worse, but different advice uh, as to whether or not there's just a better way. Um, Council member, just, just to clarify, the, the advisory opinion spoke not at all to any contribution to a campaign fund. So the, the, the board never has, has exempted itself from any opinion, including today, about the operation of the campaign finance law. No, so I, contributions to a campaign to a campaign that could be used to pay campaign fees or anything like that, the board did not, in that advisory opinion, say those were gifts. The only arena that the board opined on in that advisory opinion and the advice it gave to the public servant who was asking was an independent legal defense fund that had nothing to do with the campaign finance board. Would those contributions be gifts? And the board to that said, all we have is the conflicts of interest law. That's all we have to interpret. If a public servant gets money from someone because of their city position, that's a gift. Okay. I mean, you have a line in here that the board considers contributions to such legal defense funds as it would any gifts to the public servant personally, and I recognize that. Um, but again, there is a there is a math a, ma a method and a mechanism by which to establish a version of a legal defense fund using the election law and the campaign finance act versus kind of having this you know this this no man's land tr uh, the trust that's really governed and uh, governed under, under the ETPL and and our own conflicts law and the only reason it's governed under a conflicts law is because we are deeming um, a contribution to a fund to be a gift. But my point is that since legal fees can be paid from, from campaign accounts, they don't need to be deemed gifts. And the board has obviously, as is law, gifts to uh, candidates that are put into a campaign account are not gifts, they're contributions. Um, I also want to talk about the auditing. And I, and I recognize you're one of the smallest agencies in the city uh, and, and with with uh, that uh, tiny bureaucracy, it's not really a bureaucracy, it's just a small office. And uh, you do a lot because you receive all the reports from all the people around the city who have to file reports. It's many, many people. Uh, the public uh, officials, the elected officials who file, you have to have a tool that puts that out there uh, almost immediately. I know it's done within a couple of weeks, I think. You make it public, you put it on the website. And so I recognize that, that you do have um, uh, very deliberate obligations um, and don't have auditors on staff. However, $10, 5, between five and $10,000 per audit, I just want to clarify what we're talking about here. We're talking about a fund that raises money and basically pays one vendor, maybe two vendors, right? Who are the vendors? The lawyers. Occasionally, maybe a fundraiser to raise the money for the lawyers, but then so it's three vendors. Um, it's not the kind of you know great deep dive audit that should entail a five to ten thousand dollar audit expense, and I'm wondering if you've again just for cost saving measures. We have a lot of auditors who work for the city, you know, on the Department of Finance, the Controller's Office, other agencies. Have you inquired whether or not it's necessary to kind of outsource? Um, I mean, between five and ten thousand dollars an audit. That's a lot of money. There's many city agencies that contract for auditors. We looked at some of those contracts and that's where those figures come from. The documents that are being reviewed are confidential documents based on the legislation. Some of them are in terms of the expenditures and legal fees and things like that. These are not the kinds of documents that another city agency should be entitled to look at. I imagine 
some of the detailed uh, legal billing wouldn't be something that should be public or would anyone who is recipient, a beneficiary of a trust would want to be public. So that needs to be done separately. Additionally, the bill requires a certain kind of auditor to do these audits. So that's something we'd need to have a specific person, a contracted auditor. We'd be delighted if these auditing functions will be done um, at a lower cost. Certainly our agency has a long track record of doing a lot with very little and we'd hope to be able to bring that same principle oh, I'm of thinking, efficiency. Can, can you just, just hire one guy? We, we need, we, the government, the fact that the bill requires uh, the GAGA standard, that's a uh, certification that the agency doesn't have. It would cost a lot for the agency, uh, time and money for the agency to get that kind of certification. It would be more efficient for us to hire an external auditor who already has that kind of certification to do these audits on a quarterly basis, particularly given um, what Council Member Power raised about how it could be one fund, it could be 50 funds. So that kind of flexibility would enable with a contract rather than having a full-time staff person or multiple staff people dedicated to that role. If the, if the requirement of, of the GAGAS certified auditor is such that your agency actually has to be audited versus the actual, um, uh, certified versus the actual individual having to be certified? That's our understanding and the agency would need to be itself audited every three years in order to maintain that certification. Okay. So it's, it's a, we have learned as, as um, uh, Ethan Carrier mentioned that it's a cumbersome process and it took even the campaign finance board with a staff of 100 a long time to achieve that level of certification. Yeah, I, don't think, I still don't think they have it, but I, I wouldn't encourage, I wasn't aware that, uh, that, that the agency itself needed to be certified. I thought that it was a, kind of a license like you have a license. To, yeah, that's not my understanding, okay. council member. Um, uh, I, I mean, I would just say that, you know, gagas or not, an audit of, of, a, of a filing of three months for a legal defense fund shouldn't take more than you know two three hours max. It's not a lot of. It shouldn't take a lot of money. So I hope you're right. I, I'm <laughs> just lo I'm just looking at some of the some of the conundra that's being thrown at you, and I do recognize that you didn't draft the bill. You didn't have a hand in drafting the bill. It's you're you're coming here to provide your expert opinion on something that you did not have uh, your hand in. Um, uh, Councilman Powers uh, asked if you are comfortable with. The, uh, the, the limits of the amount, and you, I'm not gonna ask you to go back into that, and I understand, I agree with you, by the way, that, the, uh, uh, that when you're talking about a legal defense fund, you really can't just kind of go out there and raise it at $5 clips. It's not a campaign, it's, it's a bill, it's due, it needs to be paid, and you have to go and raise the money to do it because people sign contracts and are expected to be paid for services mm -hmm. rendered, and, Lawyers, that's, you know, we expect to be paid when we're done with the job. Um, but I'm wondering if you have a concern about, in effect, double dipping, where a candidate for public office can be raising money for his campaign committee at the same time uh, as raising money for this entity, which is not necessarily a campaign committee, but you're essentially going to the same people. So as Councilman Powers uh, uh, mentioned, you know, the limit is, I don't even know what the current limit is. It's 2850. It changes every day now here. Um, but, you know, you go to the person, you say, can you write me a check for 2850? Hey, and also, can you write me a $5,000 check for my legal defense fund? Um, I don't envision that necessarily being a problem because I tend to think that those who have to raise money for legal defense funds tend to not uh, be soliciting campaign contributions anymore. But in the case where they are, are you concerned about that? I think, Council Member, your from an point from an ethical point of view, not right, from a practical point. Right. Of view. As a, well, as a practical matter, I think the point that you raised is probably right. Because of the process for establishing a fund, they have to actually have a cognizable action. They have to go to the law department and get a letter denying uh, representation. So it's, it seems like it would it would, as a practical matter, be beyond the time that you're raising funds for the campaign. The campaign is concluded. If it's in that context, at least fines have been imposed, and a legal defense needs to be. Um, instituted for that particular thing, so it seems like it would unlikely as a practical matter be simultaneous. The issue that you raised, if for some reason it happened to be simultaneous, may be that the, that the, the fines for camp the first term or coming up during the second term fundraising, yeah, that's, uh, it's, a, it's certainly an issue. We're not, we're not as uh, Mr. Carrier mentioned, we're not the best people uh, or the right people to be answering those kinds of questions. There's the experts in the campaign They're the best finance. people, just not the right people. I, I'll, I will conclude <laughs> with this. It's a statement, not a question, but um, uh, since you're there and I, I only get the microphone a little bit, they 
bring me out with a cane at some point. But um, I, I will say that I agree uh, with uh, my colleagues who have said this earlier that there does need to be a mechanism uh, by which a public servant uh, doesn't have uh, an, an enormity of legal expenses hanging over the head. Um, and, it's, and it's not just the name that, that's in the paper most recently, but there have been others uh, who, who are certain, certainly entitled to have this removed from them. And the truth is that um, I, I read your emails that you send out uh, every two weeks of people who uh, uh, have almost, in almost every case, undelivered, just not deliberately broken the campaign finance, the, the conflicts of interest law. And I imagine that those who don't have, uh, who aren't members of unions do have to undergo personal expense and they don't often have it. And if maybe they need to set up a little thing where they ask people for money. So this is this possibly something that is necessary. And I, I do want to say that in my, my questions, and the reason I made that little spiel was to make sure that it's indicated in public that my questions are not, are not to be viewed as, as a negative on the concept, um, but simply that I think that the mechanism can be better. Uh, and I think that uh, during, during the process of deliberation after this hearing, uh, before it moves forward, I hope that the council and the administration and the conflicts of interest board and the campaign finance board can get together to try to figure out a way that uh, we can do some of these things a little bit better, particularly the first topic that we spoke about, the notion that we have city employees a couple of hundred yards away from here who won't share information with you. I'm shocked to hear that. I'm sure that anybody who's sitting and listening to this, I know that they're not here today, would be shocked to learn that the campaign finance board, which is always so excited to put out information in the public uh, is uh, not willing to share with the good people at the Conference of Interest Board their very proprietary tool that I paid for with my tax dollars. And thank you very much for being here today. Thank you so much, Council Member. I, I'm just curious, did they give you a rationale why they wouldn't share it with you? Just that it's their proprietary. I mean, they don't, they would, we have no, also, again, we're tiny. We have an IT, one IT person. We have no IT staff. The only thing that would be useful for us is if they built the database for us. We need someone to build it for us. They have an IT staff of, you know, dozens, very large. So the, it's not, they can, they have talked to us many times about the process that they built their database. It took them many people and many years to build the system they have and to maintain it. So information about the system, they've been willing to share. Whether they can give us a fully built tool, that, they, that they're not willing to do. And so to the line of questioning that my colleague was making, it, let me get to the heart of it. Is it you're in, in a perfect world, if you had a choice, is this is something that you want to minister? Or would you prefer for CFB to do it? <laughs> <laughs> Look, in a perfect world? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, you know, they, uh, CFB has a couple of advantages uh, over the conflicts of interest board here. One of which is, as we've been discussing, they, they, they uh, have a robust in-house staff of people who build reporting systems uh, like the one that is uh, set forth in this legislation. The second thing that they have is that they do GAGAS auditing. So uh, they, they have experience with that. We're, we, we are informed by them that that took uh, many years and a lot of resources for them to get together and, 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 and really um, operating well for them. Uh, but they've got that going now. So those are two, two big advantages that they have here. So I agree with you. I mean, it's cost effective. They already have the expertise. We don't have to reinvent the wheel because basically that's what we're being asked to do here. Uh, so I'm a little baffled. Why well, put it on you? You had to now start from scratch uh, rather than, as my colleague was pointing out, give it to the people who are already uh, know. So you will be, uh, you will concur, there will be, you, you, you wouldn't have hard feelings if you end up uh, at CFB, right? Uh, I, I, right. I mean, they, they, they have many they have many advantages uh, for for handling something like this. This is this is in many ways a, a similar to what they do already. Okay, I'll take that as a yes. Yeah, no hard feelings. <laughs> no hard feelings. Um, I chair, chair, just just to yes, clarify, I'm, I'm not suggesting that the campaign finance board have have another thing yet. Uh, 
uh, to claim that politicians are crooks. So maybe we don't give them the task, but perhaps we can amend the legislation to require the CFB uh, since they are happy to take uh, taxpayers' dollars every single week and put it in their pockets as employees of this government to do their job, and we assign them the task of building this database, building this reporting tool for the fine people over at the Conflicts of Interest Board. I think that would be something that we can make them do. Um, it may not be bigger office space, but it'll be a little something. Well, something to look at. I, I'm, my thoughts were since they Sorry. are already. May I just, uh, Absolutely. I love this. We finally yes. have a Come on. Um, I, I, uh, perhaps we can look at in terms of the tool. I'm wary of, um, and I think that the bill was designed to, uh, to avoid or to be able to, to separate out legal defense trust from the campaign finance uh, system entirely. And so by bringing it into or governed by, uh, by CFB, it brings it closer to the campaign finance system instead of, instead of further away. Hmm. I, I agree, Councilman. I, I don't want them to, to administer the fund. I simply want them to, or administer the reporting. I simply want them to build the, the tool it's really just, I mean, I'm not a computer guy at all, but they have the tool. They could build it out. They build, they, they build it out all the time. It's going down on Wednesday for a couple of hours so that they can do repairs to it. They, they can simply build it out, give a reporting tool. It'll cost them nothing. They have a, like a 1,000 people who work there uh, really doing nothing all day and just waiting for this project. I almost got you off the hook. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Let me, let me just ask this uh, question before I give it to Councilman Powell so real quick. Uh, I am concerned uh, that possibly we're not giving you enough time uh, to be set up uh, to do this correctly. So would it be July that you will be fully ready because you'll be fully funded? Um, is, July is ambitious, but probably more realistic. We'd need, again, we have zero money to do it, so we'd need an allocation of funds. We'd need to go to a vendor and get the database built out. I think six months uh, is a reasonable amount of time for us to get a database built and for us to do, to get at least the wheels moving on rulemaking. It took us, um, for the last time we did a real comprehensive rulemaking uh, for the affiliated not-for-profit slot, it took us almost a full year to do it, but we've, we've, uh, we got that muscle working now, so I think we'd be able to do it a little more quickly for this. So it would be helpful if we were to move the day to six months from now? Yes. Is that what I hear you say? Okay, thank you so much. Council Member Pops. Just one other question, sorry to come back, is the, it, with the, as we talk about the Campaign Finance Board, I was thinking about the ways that you can raise money in the city in terms of what, me what, what methods you can use to raise money, which is pretty much all available methods. But um, do you have a recommendation in terms of how these funds should be able to accept money, whether it's from by check, credit card, cash, money order? Are there things that you believe should be restricted or limited in terms of what forms of payment? Yeah, I, I, as long as it, you know, as long as it's in a form that can be reasonably audited. I don't know what the requirements are under uh, the under Gaga's auditing standards, but um, but right, just needs to be in some form that can be tracked. I think under the uh, Calman will support. I think a hundred dollars cash is a limitation around that, and this state law, and um, and uh, there's like uh, all restrictions about what information needs to be stuff. So at least the minimum, I think we should look. There should be some evaluation of what CFB allows versus what this fund would allow in terms of forms of payment allow, accepted and what disclosures required when you give them to make sure that we're sort of adhering to things that I think have been long deliberated about what can get you in trouble or not. So just one idea, but thank you. I wanna thank you uh, so much for uh, your testimony today and, and for the information you provided. And with that, I want to thank also the staff, my colleagues, uh, for staying all the way through. Thank you so much. Thank you.